Hey y'all, thanks for thanks for waiting. Um, there's this thing that happens uh, <laughs> with updating computers, right? Where it's like, yes, it's going to take three minutes for this update, and then it's like, we're just going to restart, and then I'm I'm looking at like a a 30 minute update, and that's great. Uh, so uh, the computer that I was streaming on, I I was like, oh yeah, I can definitely. Anyway, you know the drill. That's the kind of thing that happens. Um, and lesson learned, I will not ever update my computer again. That's just, that's just real. Okay. So uh, we're gonna start off with a question um, in, in one of the threads. It's uh, how do we sum only even or odd integers out of a mixed list? So this is, let me grab this. I think we may have gone over this one the other day. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what? Let me uh, let me find where this is located. That's under accumulators, and it is. Um, list accumulators, I believe. And um, actually, uh, do you mind uh, posting in, uh, pasting in a link to the lesson where that challenge is located? Uh, it might be quicker than me tracking it down. No. Still looking for it. So one moment. Oh, okay, it's integer accumulators challenge one, I believe. That's what it is. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, integer accumulators challenge. Huh. Challenge one. Ah, there we go. It's actually challenge three. Okay, perfect. So. Why don't we look at this? Um, integer uh, accumulators challenge three, uh, sum up only the odd integers from a mixed data list. Um, so a little typo there. Uh, using an accumulator variable called odd sum. Okay, um, I believe that's the one we're, we're considering. So, um, so we'll make this we're summing up only the odd integers, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, so looking at this, we can see which integers are odd, right? 9, 21, 35, 15, um, 9, and that's it. We don't want to include 3.67. So we're going to start off with uh, just, you know, um, whatever we want to call this odd sum. So the test for this challenge is expecting something called odd sum, right? Let me just clear that and resize that. Um, so odd sum, we're going to start that at zero. We're assuming an integer, so not 0, 0.0, but just zero. And we're going to say for, um, I don't know, for element, we could do element, or sometimes uh, people will do el. For el in um, in mixed data, if uh, is instance is instance of el, if this is an integer, 
Now, there's something a little tricky with this. Um, I think I, I alluded to this, or I demonstrated this yesterday or the day before. Um, if is instance of the element, if it's an int, right? We're just checking to see if this is an int, then we can we can add it to odd sum. There's a caveat here though, and um, I'm just going to, first I'm gonna print the odd sum, and we'll just look at what we get. Um, Python delmi.py, 16, okay. Um, does 16 make sense? Doesn't really look like it, actually, unless we've got negative ints, nope. So 9 plus 21, so this, hmm. Strange, what am I doing wrong here? 9, 21, 35, 15, 3, 9, and that should be it. Um, hmm, am I in the right? Directory, hmm, for each element in yeah, I'm a little a little uh, stumped here. <laughs> Honestly, I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, I'm checking for integers and I mean this isn't. This shouldn't work quite correctly yet uh, because we're not checking for odd integers, but let me see. All right, if is instance L, uh, let's just do this. And uh, L modulo two equals one. Sometimes my brain just doesn't start working quite right uh, right away. Hmm. Yeah, maybe somebody can just point out what I'm doing, <laughs> what I'm doing incorrectly here. Um, if you see it, sometimes this is a. Uh, sometimes it just takes somebody else looking at it. Um, Int object is not iterable. Um, wow, I'm I'm just uh, surprised I'm not seeing what I'm doing wrong here. Um, does the false register as an int? Uh, yes, it should. The false uh, should register an, as an int with is instance, and that that's kind of the caveat that I was uh, alluding to. Um, but looking at this, you know. If we're summing up the odd integers, there's something uh, wrong in my logic here. I'm just not seeing what it is. Uh, so 9 plus 21. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to paste in a, another way to do this uh, from one of the students. Let me just see if this gets us where we want to go name odd sum is not defined oh need to define odd sum right there okay this is the correct value all right so i'm not actually sure why is instance here why don't we do this I'm going to return to this code and let, let's see what Python thinks of as an integer because I am a little a little confused as to why it's probably something obvious that I'm missing. This is uh, one of those things when you program a lot and you know you just kind of overlook these very basic potential things. So let's look at this. Uh, okay, so These are all the integers, right? Uh, 59, 21, 16, 48, false, right? So we want to exclude false. 
So we want to say um, and is instance of el. We want to put not not is instance of el bool, right? And that should get rid of false. So now we're dealing with uh, 50, 9, 21, 16. So let's get a, get rid of the evens and um, el modulo 2 equals 1. And we should be able to sum with that, with whatever's left. So 9, 21, 35, 15, 3, 9, 6. Um, so if I... Oh, <laughs> odd sum plus gets one. This, you know, this is this is brilliance right here. Um, trying to troubleshoot for every error, and it's the most obvious error. And that, that's usually how this goes. So odd sum plus gets EL. Uh, so the assumption is that this is what the question is asking for, and that we should get 92. So let, let's just see if that is, in fact, what we're going to get here. Okay, yeah, that worked. So notice it's just a, we're checking three possibilities here. Um, we're saying if is instance, if it's an integer, uh, and then whenever you check for integer, if you don't want to include bools, you have to uh, explicitly exclude them in Python. Uh, I've, I've said it before, I find that a little bit odd, a little frustrating. Um, and then, and uh, the modulo two on the element equal to one, which just means it's an, it's an odd number. And then, of course, you take this element and you increment it, uh, you accumulate it into the odd sum, and that should work. Okay. So hopefully that was the question that was being asked. Um, and the question, does the false register as an int? or only if it is true. Um, the uh, false will register as an int, but it's zero, right? Um, so we're not gonna accumulate it in either way. So we don't actually have to exclude for it, but imagine if the mixed list was different and it had a true in it, right? And not a false. Then we would have to explicitly exclude it. Um, in that case, 16 is correct. Haven't checked for odd yet. Um, Yep, and there's uh, some good code in there. Um, yeah, the thing that I was doing wrong is a an issue that I run into that's hard for me to troubleshoot. There's there's a couple things that get me every time, and one is remembering to do dot items on a dictionary. The other is um, when I do an incrementation. If I'm incrementing by uh, a value that's uh, being that's taken from an iterator like mixed data, um, this value. Often I'll increment by one instead of by the value that I want to increment by. And then it's like I don't even see it. Uh, and it takes me forever to troubleshoot. Um, that's one of those things if you're pair coding and somebody knows you do that, then they're going to point that out to you every time they see it. Um, okay, cool. So uh, there was a request that we review some questions from a sample mock interview. Um, yeah, I think we can do that. I think we can do that. Yeah, um, let me let me track down a mock interview really quick. And uh, we we don't do so many mock interviews. Uh, we we do them uh, sometimes upon request, but um, just in you know in terms of uh, time, more often we'll share um, we'll share a notebook of a mock interview and we'll do something like that. So um, I'm either going to, let me think about this. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, track down a mock interview. Otherwise I'll, you know, uh, invent something really quick that we could use. Um, let's see. Just need to track something down. I think I have it uh, right around here.
You know what? I think somebody shared with me this mock interview the other day. I haven't actually looked at it much in recent times, so let's see if I can find it. Oh, there we go. Uh, I've got it. All right. So So what I'll do is I'll kind of use this as a template and we'll consider, um, we'll, we'll just uh, sort of riff on it, I guess. And, you know, think about other kinds of questions we might ask um, that would be like this kind of mock interview. So um, this is in a Jupyter notebook. And let's see if I can there we go. All right. All right, this is good. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll bring this up um, and we'll just look at the kind of problem this is. Okay, so this is kind of a textbook-ish problem where like uh, data are sent and received by computers via networks. Each piece of data is split into packets to make transmission manageable for networks to serve multiple devices, sure. And for computers to be transmitting data to or from different places simultaneously, oh, that's all the same sentence, semicolon, while this system is typically reliable, 0.01% of packets, which are transmitted, transmitted, end up being corrupted in some way, shape, or form. So let's define a random experiment that consists of data packets being transmitted until the first corrupted data packet is encountered. Okay, so um, the probability distribution that we're considering here is geometric. Um, and geometric is, uh, you know, we can just think about the geometric distribution as a series of Bernoulli trials uh, we're counting the number of Bernoulli trials up until the first success, right? So it's how many failures would it would occur before the first success, either including the first success or not including the first success, depending on which form of the geometric distribution we're talking about. So, um, you know, we can look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia geometric distribution, and we can find out a little bit more about this directly. Uh, we definitely have this in our learn mater materials, uh, but I just want to show you offhand, we've got two different PMFs. And one of these PMFs is for zero less than P less than or equal to one. Uh, oh, actually, sorry. Uh, one of these PMFs, where is, where is this described? Um, mm, Uh, shoot. One of these is inclusive of the first success. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're, we're essentially modeling how many failures there are before the first success. So there could be, uh, you know, up until and including. So when is the first success? Uh, if the first success is on the first trial, then the elements of K are one, two, three, all the way up until k, right? Um, whereas uh, if we're talking about the failures up until the first trial, then we're considering uh, zero failures, right? Which is the first success. So these are actually equivalent. Um, the PMF here is equivalent. If we are including the first success, so, um, you know, could be on the first trial we get a success, then we're going to do this 1 minus p to the k minus 1 times p. If we don't include the first success, um, so we can have zero failures, right? Then we say, uh, we're talking about how many failures up until the first success, uh, one minus P to the K times P. And this construct, uh, you know, looks like a lot of other things. So, you know, what does log odds look like? Um, log odds has a similar construct, right? Where we have log P minus log one minus P, right? 
th this is a uh, a form that exists across um, you know uh, statistics across uh, um, machine learning and you know uh, we can see something that looks like logit right here like log odds within the geometric anyway um, it's something you can dig into more uh, if we're considering this the system is typically reliable 0.01% of packets end up being corrupted in some way so um, when we're talking about 0.01% uh, uh, percent, we're really talking about 0 0.0001 right so this is our uh, our probability of failure is equal to that um, something uh, that I'm just setting aside right and um, in this case we're we're probably talking about how many successful packets we can have uh, before the first corrupted packet happens right so <clears throat> uh, in this case we are going to complete a couple a couple functions and this is uh, kind of what the technical interview looks like you know you you look at the warm-up there's a warm-up generally um, where we have you code a couple simple functions you know it could be factorial or it could be um, you know a random uh, get a random bit and then build a random binary list something like that and then after that, we generally ask you some probability questions. So, um, you know, here we're just saying, hey, uh, complete the geometric PMF function. So this is going to be fairly easy, right? We just go geometric PMF. And uh, this is going to take uh, P and K, right? Those are our, and we can see that in the doc string, P. And, and definitely read your doc strings. Um, if you want to use these doc strings correctly, you would actually put it in here, right? You would put it in the function itself, and um, that's where it should live. Um, although, you know, it does make it a little bit tricky to read uh, when you're just coding this out on the fly. Usually you add in a doc string after you code the function, or as a placeholder um, before you've coded the function, right? And then you put like a pass here or something to that effect. Uh, so I'll just code this without the doc string here, um, just to just to do it. So we've got two parameters, p and k. P is a float, and uh, k is an integer. Why is that? Well, p is the probability, right? And k is uh, the number of trials. In this case, the integer representing the number of trials. Well, that's not totally, uh, you know, telling us which geometric function we're using. Um, so we might need to look, read back here. Uh, models the number of failures before the first success. That's the version of the geometric, geometric uh, PMF that we're using, one minus P to the K times P. And you know we can verify that. Uh, you can't use, uh, you can't Google stuff during the technical interview, but let's just verify um, you know, how many failures up until uh, the first success, but not including the first success, we can see here that, uh, sure enough, this is what uh, Wikipedia is telling us as well. Um, this is one of those things about geometric that uh, gets people caught up um, determining which uh, PMF to use. And the, the rule of thumb here is just choose one and always use that one. But it's going to change how you frame the question, right? So either it's all the failures up into uh, all the failures before the first success, or it's all the trials uh, how many trials uh, do you need, or how many trials including the first success, right? And those just look different. And that's the last time I'll say that uh, for right now. Um, I'm just saying it again so that we know which one we're working with. Okay, um, so this is an easy function to write. The probability that x is k is going to be 1 minus p to the k times p. Uh, so we can just say return, um, you know, oops, 1 minus p to the k times p. And that's simple enough. So, um, you know, if we're curious about um, what is the probability, let's, let's think about this in terms of coin flips. That's often an easy way to think about this. What is the probability that you'll get... Uh, five heads before you get a tails, right? Um, so let's just set P to 0.5, uh, 
and we'll set k to 5. So we're going to get a success on the sixth trial. That's what we're saying here. And I'll need to do this. Yeah, OK. Uh, so 0 0.01565. Um, what is the probability of getting zero? Um, zero failures bef before a success on the first trial, right? That's going to be 0.5. And that that's intuitively that intuitively makes sense, right? So um, we're saying there are zero failures before you get your first heads. There are zero tails before you get your first heads. And with a coin flip, that's going to be heads or tails, right? So that makes sense. Zero point five would be our first value. Um, and uh, in a geometric process, a simple geometric process like this, we see a rate. We see sort of a decay in the probability, right? So um, point five. If we we're looking at one failure, well. One failure before the first success is 0.25. And uh, two failures before the first success, well, that's going to be 0.125, and so on, right? And you, you might see here that there is, this is actually 0.5 um, raised to the uh, raised to the failures, right? Um, that's that's kind of nice. We can see that here. Uh, OK. So let's let's continue forward. So in general, okay, so we're we're going to make a geometric CDF function, okay? We made the geometric PMF, let's make the geometric CDF. Now, um, we're going to do this in two ways and uh, there are more than two ways to do this obviously, but let's do this in two ways. Um, let's say geometric uh, CDF um, we're going to have a P and a K and this, this time our K is the high value, you know, it's, it's, it's the value that we're considering up until, right? And, uh, we can do this, we can do this pretty easily by just saying, um, well, let's make an accumulator and I'm just going to call this Praba started at 0, 0.0. .0. I'm going to say for uh, k in range, and maybe I'll just say, uh, uh, we'll call this k. This is the number of failures before the first success. So this is k high. It should be inclusive. Um, and we're going to start this at 0. This is important to, to think about. We're going to start this at 0 because we can have 0 failures before the, the first success. Our k high here is going to be then inclusive. It's going to be k high plus one, and um, you know that's just uh, let's say if we're asking what's the probability of getting five failures well uh, before the first success. Well, we want to include five, so we're doing five plus one, and we're just going to say proba plus gets um, the geometric PMF of uh, p. And k, p has been passed in. And then uh, k, we're getting that from this iteration. And then uh, we'll return proba. OK. Um, if we want to answer a question here, what is the question? Uh, the network admin needs to be reasonably sure that none of the data packets will be corrupted during this transfer. Write a function called the geometric CDF and determine the probability that all 300,000 packets will be transferred without any data being corrupted. OK, so we're just going to call this. Um, we'll do print geometric CDF. And um, probability is going to be uh, 0. Point, well, it's going to be whatever this is. Um, it's going to be 1 minus this. So uh, if our probability of failure is 0.01%, uh, then we want to consider the probability of success, right? So we're going to say um, 1 minus 0 0.0001. And then the next part of that, what is our k high? Well, that's uh, 300,000 packets um, uh, being delivered successfully. Is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. We actually just want to put in 0 0.001 because we're considering failure to be a success here, right? Um, 
so there's a very low probability of uh, a, well, relatively low, let's say. This is, you know, one out of, um, oh, sorry. Um, this is, uh, you know, one out of uh, th a thousand. Um, one out of 10,000? Oh my gosh. Sometimes my math just like malfunctions in my head. Um, and so we're considering, you know, what is the probability that out of 300,000 packets being delivered, what is the probability that we're going to have none of these fail? Well, in this case, a, a failure is a quote unquote success. And um, that's what we're really trying to find the probability of. So let's, let's run this. Yeah, it's 10,000, thank you. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, give me some linear algebra, give me some like, uh, I don't know, differential equations, and uh, I do pretty good. Um, but some, oh, what's my error here? Hmm, where is this error? K high 300,000. Yeah, but basic arithmetic, sometimes my brain just like checks out. Um, oh, of course, uh, I'm using a positional, uh, I do, I make this mistake sometimes. Uh, if I use a positional um, variable here, uh, positional argument there, I need to also use. Um, I need to also use the actual uh, parameter name here. So I could do something. I could do this, right? Um, and that would work. But you can't have a uh, sorry a um, a keyword argument that precedes a positional argument, right? Because uh, Python doesn't really know um, which one you're referring to when you do that. So um, the probability that um, hmm, um, I think I'm thinking about this in an inverted way. I just have to double think this. Um, That just seems like like a high probability for this to be successful. Um, if we included the failure, would we start at one? Yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if we included the ultimate success, we would start at one. That is true. Um, so let me. Let me think about this for a second. So, um, network administrator, the network admin needs to resume. Okay. Um, data packets are corrupted 0.01% of the time. So, Oh, yeah, we definitely want this to be one minus this, don't we? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so if we were trying to consider um, the probability of, let's say, 300 of these being successful, right? There's a really good chance that 300 of these will be successful. Um, if if we're trying to consider the probability of 3,000 being successful, uh, it's still pretty good. And uh, 30,000, well, let's see, still pretty good. Uh, 300,000, wait a minute, what is going on here? Hmm. Let me just uh, do a little sanity check here. I 
Okay, so I guess it's just still really probable that uh, these are going to be successful. Maybe somebody can see an error I'm making here, possibly. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Oops. I feel like I need to come back and look at this problem later. Um, at any rate, uh, we can write this CDF in a couple different ways, right? Uh, we can do um, we can do the closed form of the CDF, and uh, why don't we write that really quick? So this is a classic way to you know an accumulator way to make a cumulative function, uh, and so we can write this a different way. So geometric CDF, and let's do closed. And let's do p and then k high. And when we do this, um, we can just return. Oops, we can return one minus one minus p to the k. Oops, k plus one. And this is going to be k high plus one. So let's let's check this and see if we get the same result that we were seeing before. Um, just trying to check my sanity on this. Okay, okay. We're getting the, the, same, uh, the same result. And uh, essentially the same result. Uh, we're getting a round to, to one. So, yeah, hmm. Hmm. I think I am uh, lightly confusing myself here. <laughs> I think it would be, yeah, it would be. Um, because we're talking about failure of a chip, I, I think I confused myself about this um, just a little bit. Uh, the probability of getting 300,000 successes uh, prior to the first failure, um, this is, uh, you know, we would invert the way we think about this. That's 300,000 failures until the first success where the first success is uh, actually the failure of the chip. And the probability of failure of the chip is 0 0.0001. And so um, this should be next to nothing, given that one in uh, 10,000 chip, chips should fail, right? And we're dealing with 300,000. So this is where I was like getting myself caught up. I'm like, this doesn't look right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have guaranteed success here. We should have guaranteed failure. Um, or not guaranteed failure. We should have um, the a probability that is less than one, right? So let me just uh, one minus one minus p to the k high. Am I k high plus one? Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is what happens when you don't look at a mock interview for quite a while. Um, so what we usually do here, and I'm just going to do uh, this part, this next part, um, to, you know, kind of, uh, I'm going to do this, and then we're going to switch back to materials on learn and questions that people have. Um, we... Um, we usually ask you to pack in values into a dictionary, right? And how this looks is is pretty straightforward, and um, it's kind of using a dictionary as an analytic approach. So here we're talking about complete the geometric PMF dictionary function. So let's define that geometric PMF dictionary, and uh, we're going to take uh, a min, a max, and a probability here. So I'll just grab this whole little snippet and. Um, we're going to consider what these might be. 
So the lower bound for the range for K uh, is min, max is the upper bound for the range of K. Uh, we're gonna assume, assume inclusive here. Um, it's not stated here, but we're going to assume inclusive. And the probability of, of success on any given trial, which is P. So um, the, the way that we might go about this is, uh, well, we make a dictionary, right? We make a dictionary. I, I like to use the uh, dictionary constructor like this, but you could also do that. Either way is fine. Um, I like this because uh, I often will think a dictionary is a set when I just read through code. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's something I, it's a uh, thing my brain does that I don't, um, I can't seem to undo. <laughs> so uh, I just use the dictionary constructor like this. And then we can say for um, K in range, and we're gonna go from the min to the max and we're going to put in the, the p value that we have already decided on. So um, in this case, I'm going to say d sub k. And this is nice. Uh, notice here we're, we're dealing with the uh, geometric CDF, right? So um, if we're dealing with the geometric CDF, we can, um, we can expect to see a probability that grows from uh, the initial trial, right? because it's going to be uh, d sub zero is going to be the probability, uh, the PMF of, of uh, k equals zero, right? And then uh, d sub one is going to be the PMF of, um, the PMF of k uh, equals zero plus the PMF of k equals one, right? And, and so this accumulation is going to happen as we, as we go through. So, um, we don't have to use the PMF here. We can just use this CDF. And it's a little less computationally intensive to use the closed CDF, um, this you know single formula instead of doing um, iteration in this case. So let's go ahead and throw this in here. Geometric CDF closed. Uh, we're going to pass in, oh wait, uh, we don't need P in this range. My bad. So min max, uh, max plus one is actually what we're going to do. And we're gonna pass in uh, geometric CDF closed of P and then K high is actually our max here. Oh, not K high, uh, it's going to be K since we're drawing K from here. So um, this should get us the PMF, uh, sorry, the CDF for every value of, of uh, K within a certain range. And then we can just return the dictionary. And when I do that, uh, let's let's do for key value in geometric CDF dictionary. And we'll go from zero to 20. And let's do a P of a probability of, uh, let's do 0 0.08. So eight out of 100, right? Um, eight, eight out of 100 chance that we're going to get a success. And we're going to see the probability that we will have gotten, uh, that we'll get a success on the next trial for every value of num trials, right? So I'm just gonna print the F string of K and then we'll do V and see what this gets us. It gets us an error because we cannot unpack an iterable. I think I mentioned this, the kind of thing that I forget all the time, dot items on a dictionary. And uh, we can see right here, uh, we can see something here that we can we can analyze. And of course, uh, for zero trials, um, we're dealing with about an eight, you know, a 0 0.08 probability that we're not going, that we're going to have zero failures, right? Because um, that's our probability of success right there. And then um, for uh, one failure before the first success, um, notice that this uh, kind of doubles, not exactly doubles, but it kind of doubles. And then um, we keep growing our probability. So uh, success within um, success, uh, sorry, uh, success after 20 or less trials, we would describe as uh, 0.826 probability, right? So that's, this is the core of our technical interview, right? This is, this is the, um, if you can get this far, then it's really just a matter of transforming 
this dictionary in some way, right? So you call out to the geometric CDF dict and uh, maybe you do something like, well, instead of getting the probabilities here, well, um, maybe you would, uh, hmm, you would uh, synthesize uh, counts of, you know, like if you're, if you're doing this geometric trial over and over and over again, um, let's say 10,000 times, then you might say uh, that there's an expected number of times that you would see 18 trials, uh, that you would see uh, 18 or less failures before your first success. And um, there's a certain number of times that would be, and if you're doing 10,000 uh, trials of, of this, of this uh, geometric process, then you could just multiply that whole thing by 10,000 and and you get these numbers, right? These numbers are, uh, you know, they might be a little tricky to interpret, right? You're observing a phenomenon, like let's say um, you have a very unfair coin that only gets heads eight of the times. Well, you keep flipping and you get tails, um, you know, you get tails on the first try, um, you know, 800 out of the 10,000 times you perform this, this experiment, right? Uh, and that, that would make sense here. And then um, you could also say, well, you get, head, you get heads after um, one trial, um, one or less trials, right? One or less failures about 1,500 times uh, out of 10,000. And this is theoretical, right? This is a projection. This is, not, um, this is not an actual observation, but it is the synthesis of a theoretical distribution of counts uh, given a number of samples, right? And of course, if we increase this to say 100,000, um, well, we're seeing, um, we're seeing uh, consistently these these numbers. Uh, they they look kind of the same, right? Uh, and that that really tells you that this is geometric. We're just adding another um, level of precision when we do this. So uh, something to think about here, though, is we have we've cast this to an integer, and if we don't cast this to an integer, let's see what we get. Uh, well, we get an error because I messed up the F string. Okay, something. Okay, that's fine. All right. So these are actual, these are the actual expectations of the counts. Um, because we're including, you know, more precision, uh, you know, an expected value, even for a discrete distribution can have uh, decimal places. But um, if we're trying to think about this, in terms of what we're observing in the wild, um, we are probably going to round down. Um, like I floored everything, but we could round up and round down, uh, and that would be fine. Uh, either way would be fine. It would probably make more sense to round up and round down, but uh, at any rate, we're going to be losing information, right? We're losing any information to the right. Uh, to be clear though, some of this information to the right is probably, uh, an artifact of the um, the way these numbers are stored, and so can we really say that that something over here is meaningful? Uh, you know, if we do even more trials, right? Are those meaningful? Um, that's hard to say. You know, it's still an expected value, but these become less and less meaningful to the right. Uh, just you know, just so that you're aware of that. Um, but that's a that's an aspect of computing that you want to keep in mind um, that you do lose uh, you do lose meaning in values further to the right because of how float numbers are stored in memory. You know, um, for example, why is this not eight? <laughs> why is this not eight hundred? Right? Why is this not eight hundred? It's that's actually due to um, how this is stored in the computer. Um, yeah, so this would be the kind of transformation, a, 
an, an example of a kind of transformation you might see in the technical interview. Um, at the end of the day, uh, what you see in the technical interview is going to be covering um, you know, basic probability, it's going to be covering uh, basic coding. You definitely want to be able to, you know, if given a formula, a mathematical formulation, um, you want to be able to commit code for that. That's, that's important. Um, you also want to be able to use dictionaries to observe the outcomes of functions. So, um, yeah. And I'll, I'll just stop there uh, in regards to the technical interview. Um, you know, I'm probably going to talk more about it, especially as we get closer to uh, what we call interview season, which is the few weeks before the cutoff. Uh, in those three weeks, we're usually pretty swamped. Um, the, sooner, the sooner you can interview, the better. Like if you feel like you can pass, definitely set up your interview. Um, and if you're in the premium prep, uh, you know, the next couple classes are going to be covering distributions. Um, you know, we covered binomial, we're going to cover Poisson, um, most of Poisson next time. And we're going to be covering geometric after that. If all of that is like, oh yeah, that's easy. Um, then I would recommend booking your interview, studying up for it, uh, trying to get it out of, out of the way sooner than later. Um, you know, even if you take the interview in the last week of the premium prep class, that's, we have no problem with that. Um, you know, at the point where, you know, around Wednesday, we will have covered all the tools you will need to pass the technical interview if you're in the premium prep course. Um, if not, you know, I always point people at the uh, technical interview lectures. So um, where are these? YouTube, uh, the Galvanized DSI technical interview coding prep. Um, this process, uh, kind of the process that I showed over here on the right, um, is gone to gone into in some detail uh, in these. And there's a, a number of different examples of this kind of analytic approach using, um, you know, the binomial distribution, using a polynomial function, um, analyzing the, the outcome outcomes of the sigmoid function, and Poisson. So our two main interviews cover a binomial process and sort of a deeper dive into the Poisson distribution. Those are, uh, when you interview, you're gonna get one of those interviews uh, in the next couple months. So um, I highly recommend this playlist and I'll just copy and paste this into the Slack thread. Okay, so let me just throw this in there as well. Um, yeah, and we link to this in a whole bunch of other places as well. So I'm just gonna close down this uh, mock interview and and maybe I'll come up with a, another um, problem that looks like our interview structure, but not using a distribution, using some other function. Like maybe we'll do something like that with sigmoid because uh, sigmoid's awesome. Um, sigmoid and tan h and uh, relu and these other um, these other functions that are di directly related to uh, neural nets. It might even make sense for us to code out a simple neural net and um, take a look at the uh, you know take a, a dictionary approach to analyzing the outputs of that neural net. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I I'll see about putting something like that together, um, but something that also looks like the technical interview. Okay, so uh, let's let's consider. Is this where we left off? Yeah, we left off on parallel lists. And I like talking about parallel lists, even though they are a little bit of an idea from other languages. Um, in Python, we don't generally need to use parallel lists. Now, what is a parallel list? Um, I'm going to show you a parallel list really quick. So let's make a list. And um, I'm going to make it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And um, So uh, let's make a, we'll call this list nums, and we'll call this list alpha, or alpha, alpha. 
and uh, this is just going to be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Okay. And um, what I'm going to do here, uh, is separate these out. Okay. And then So we can see uh clearly that these are related, right? These are um you know, definitely lists that are related. Oh my gosh, that's the sound of a small dog running into the room. Um so one, you know, A is the first letter. B is the second letter of the English alphabet, C is the third letter, D is the fourth, etc. Um, if we want to traverse these in a way to demonstrate that they are related, uh, there's a couple ways that we can do this. Um, one uh, very easy way is uh, we could say uh, for i, let's say idx for index in range, and we can do um, the length of one of these. So we know that they're parallel. So the same index will apply to both. We can print, um, you know, uh, list, list alf sub uh, idx is the is letter list nums sub idx and if we run this oh not clear but python um we see that a is letter one b is letter two c is letter three uh and you know we know this but you might have other kinds of related data right that um you know you want to examine in a relation there are uh, other other reasons you might do this you know like I know we haven't talked about dictionaries at this point in the materials, but you know we might do something like this. We might say, well, d sub list alf idx is going to get this value list nums sub idx, right? And um, this is just packing in a dictionary. And we'll just print d. This is just packing in a dictionary with related data. A is associated with one, B with two, C with three. We're building relations here. Um, you know, there are a number of ways to do this. Uh, I would say um, the way that we've been pushing, and this isn't a, a necessity. I'm, I'm not going to say that you need to know how to do this offhand, but this kind of relates to uh, dictionary traversal, if you look at it. Right? We could say, um, instead of this for IDX and range um, process, we could do something a little bit different and say for, um, uh, how do we want to do this? Let, let's do uh, num let in zip. And then we'll just do, since we're getting the number first, that's going to be list nums, comma, list alf. And um, in this case, this is just a little bit nicer. We can do d sub let gets num, right? And this will get us the same outcome. Uh, this is just a nice Python syntax. And, you know, oops, need a colon here. This is nice Python syntax. If I run this, I get the same exact thing. It's the same exact functionality that we saw uh, in this um, other more explicit using the index sort of approach. Uh, if you were not using Python, um, you would see something that looks more like this, right? Where uh, you have an index, if you're dealing with parallel lists, you have an index and you do this kind of thing. Um, but in Python, you know, zip is better. <laughs> it's just nicer, easier to read. Um, for number, letter, in zip of the list nums and the list alpha, um, you know, we can very clearly see this relation. The expectation here is that list nums and list alpha are the same length. So if you want to perform this kind of process, though, uh, in, in the real world, you might first do 
uh, something like this. You might do if um, list nums uh, if the length equals uh, list alpha, and I'll put in the len here. If these are the same length, then perform this operation. Uh, else, you know, um, you know, commit some kind of error, right? Uh, we have we have more formal ways of committing errors than saying print error, but um, you know, just for the moment, we can say uh, we can throw an error if this is not true because we do expect it to be true. Uh, so that's really that's really all there is to parallel lists. Um, you know, we can we can think about parallel lists in terms of analysis. So why don't we do this with, um, why don't we generate a parallel list? And I'm gonna go to Wikipedia and uh, actually just Wikipedia, not. And I'm gonna grab a random article, which is one of my favorite games. I love just John Sutton Hall. Okay. Um, I can't get myself to care necessarily about John Sutton Hall, but it is a paragraph. So um, why don't we just throw this into a string? Um, and I'll do this, I'll do a, uh, a string using double quotes because I don't think there are any double quotes in here. So blah, 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 John Sutton Hall. Um, we don't really need to read this. What we'll do is we're going, we're going to make two lists. And one is going to be a list of words, and the other list is going to be the counts of letters. Uh, sorry, the counts of the occurrences of those words. Okay, so I'm going to say uh, words, and there are a couple ways that I can do this, um, but uh, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I'm going to do this in a very uh, a very simple way. So I'm going to do words, and I'm going to do uh, word counts. Okay, and uh, I'm going to make a quick um, text cleaner, and it's going to take uh, some text, and um, so uh, we want to. What do we want to do? We want to make a copy of the text. So I'm going to just say text gets text.copy. Um, and I'm going to say for uh, letter in, actually, why don't we do this? Let's do text gets an empty string. And I'm going to say for each letter in the text, if uh, the letter is not in, um, our alphas. So I'm going to make this kind of alphas list. Alphas is going to get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, O, P, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, and um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So um, notice what I'm not including here is periods, commas, um, that's about it. The other thing um, I want to do here is for let in text dot lower. So I'm going to lowercase everything in here just in case uh, the first right there's an in right here. This should be considered the same word as lowercase in in case that exists somewhere else, and I and it does right there right. So uh, I'm just going to do that um, and. Uh, also, let's have a space in there, just because um, we want to preserve spaces. And uh, I'm going to do text clean split, and that that should work for us. So if if each let if any of these letters is not in here, um, then we're not going to append it. Or we're not going to put it on the end of our text. So text plus gets uh, each letter, and then let's return the text. And let's call this, let's do print uh, text clean split 
of the paragraph and see how that turns out. Oh, good. What is that? Um, <laughs> let me try that again. See? Okay. So obviously there's something wrong here, but um, for, for letter in text.lower, if the letter is not in, oh, if letter in alphas, right? I just showed us what we are trying to get rid of. Um, and notice what we have here is this sort of cleaned thing. John Sutton Hall is the old main building of Indiana, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we can already see, and this is kind of cool. We can see, start seeing word frequencies here. Uh, building, building, building. Um, what else is there? Uh, Sutton is going to exist a couple times. And it's kind of cool. If you look at the frequencies of, of something like this, you can kind of tell what it's about, right? Um, just by the most prevalent words, especially if you remove words like and is the, uh, an, all those things. So I'm gonna return not just the text, but I'm going to split it on spaces. So let's run that one more time. And notice now we have a list. So um, we have we have a means by which we can create a word counter. Um, and essentially, we're, we can build a vocabulary and we can build a uh, relationship between that vocabulary and the frequency of the words. So this is sort of a, a text frequency um, uh, vector, right? Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to say the words is going to get, um, I'm going to do the list set trick on text clean split of the paragraph. Now what the list set trick is going to do is it's going to take any um, any, uh, oh, whoops, I, I actually need to do this a little bit differently. Let, let's just get all the words out first. And then let's do, uh, vo uh, let's do vocabulary. And let's do uh, vocab frequency. And I think that'll, that'll guess where we want to do, guess where we want to be. So um, the vocabulary is just the list of the set of the words. This, this trick right here, this just removes, um, this simply removes duplicates. So anything in here that is duplicated, like building, um, it's only going to exist once in our vocabulary. We only have to think about it once in the vocabulary. And now we want to look at the vocabulary frequency. So what we're building is parallel lists between the vocabulary and the vocabulary frequency from the words. So what we can do here is uh, let's write a, a function that says um, build um, the term frequency and we're going to pass in a word list. And uh, the way that we can think about this is, well, we pass in a word list and uh, we also want to pass in, let's pass in the vocabulary. Is that what we want to do? Yeah, I think we do want to do this because there's a world in which we remove um, words like in, the, of, uh, what we would call stop words. There, there's a world where we might want to remove those stop words. So in this case, um, we're going to pass in the words, not the word list, but the words, and we're going to pass in the vocabulary. So this uh, words, uh, maybe it's a better name would be um, you know, the split text. Let's call it that. And we're going to pass in the vocabulary that we want to generate a frequency from uh, out of this split text. So I can say, um, you know, we don't need this vocabulary frequency defined yet, uh, but we are going to define it in here. So I'm going to say for a word in the vocabulary, we're going to uh, say um, vocab frequency is going to um, have appended to it the count from the split text, right? From the split text, the count of each word, okay? 
So notice here, we're not uh, traversing the split text, we're traversing the vocabulary, which is the uh, only the set of words from the split text. We're not dealing with um, every word individually in order, like John, counting it, Sutton, counting it, Hall, is, counting it. We're not doing that, we're looking at the individual words in the vocabulary, and then we're counting from the split text. So once we do that, we should be able to return the vocab frequency. And uh, let's go ahead and print uh, build term frequency off of, um, actually, we, we don't want to do that. We want to, uh, we're going to go ahead and make another vocab. Uh, I'll just call it TF, right? So I'm just going to make, uh, get the term frequency. Maybe I'll name it term frequency so it's not so um, cryptic. Uh, build uh, TF off of the split text. I'm just going to pass that in. And we're going to pass in the vocabulary. And uh, what we should get from this is if I print, let's do this for uh, word frequency in zip of, where is it, uh, of the vocabulary, right? Oop, not vocab frequency, but the vocabulary and the term frequency. If I do that, we can print, we can do a couple things here. We uh, can print the word and that word's frequency. So we can start there, right? And find out that name words is not defined because I named it split text. That makes sense. And let's go ahead and just check to see if this makes sense. So um, I'll just move this over here. Let's run that again. Okay, there we go. Uh, so Hall should exist twice and does it. So Sutton Hall, and it does. I'm imagining building um, occurs a few times. Uh, building occurs three times. And we could start to consider, uh, well, what if we want to um, sort these in a way, right? So maybe um, we would change vocabulary to, well, what's a good way to do this? Um, well, I won't worry about that at the moment. Uh, we could though, uh, if we, we could do this easily, I guess, if we just pack this into a dictionary. Let's make a dictionary called um, word dict and let's do uh, word dict sub word. Let's get the frequency for each of those and save that. And um, I'm going to say for a key value in word dict dot items. Remember that time, um, and maybe we want to uh, sort these by values, right? So um, I could do something like for uh, in zip, just to demonstrate zip in another way, we could do word dict dot keys, comma word. Uh, well, is that how we want to do that? Let's do this in a parallel dictionary format. Let's do uh, the words. Hmm. Yeah, let's invert this. No. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to think about this a little bit. Uh, at, at the end of the day, <laughs> um, what we get out of this is a term frequency. And, and that's really what we're going for. In, in this problem, but we did that through building parallel lists. Now, the parallel lists, honestly, are a bit of a uh, stand-in for just using a dictionary in the first place. Like, we could have gone um, with this build TF. Instead of, um, you know, creating a vocab frequency, we could have passed in the split text and the vocabulary and just built a dictionary. and. Uh, let's show that. Let's say build 
build tf dictionary and we'll do the same thing split text and vocabulary so we're going to pass in a text and we're going to pass in the vocabulary of that text and we're going to say um, for word actually we need a dictionary collector which we'll do here um, for word in uh, vocabulary so same same thing we're going to say if word not in the dictionary then we're going to set it in there right d sub word is going to be initialized with zero this is usually how i do it um, every time i do this i'll tell you this this is how i do it uh, and other people may not do it this way um, and then on every occurrence i increment it by one now you could you could do this. You could say uh, d sub word gets one, and this is how uh, many other people would do this. This is equivalent, right? Um, in this case, you are skipping the else. I just like I like this a little bit more um, personally, and then we we can return d. So um, given this, this is the same logic, and we've bypassed the parallel dictionary. Pro uh, uh, parallel list approach and instead of um, you know instead of this we could uh, we could do something like this where instead we go for word frequency in um, this dictionary dot items uh, we should be able to print just the word and oops the word and the frequency so this is a you know this is a pitch for using dictionaries and we get the same thing um you know it's probably going to be in a different order in the dictionary just uh just because um but that's not oh whoops this is not working quite correctly because we only have one building in there let me just check what's going on there um Let me just delete some of this other stuff. For word frequency in build tf dictionary. Um, D gets dictionary for word and vocabulary. If word is not in the dictionary, D sub word gets zero. Oh, of course. OK, if word not in the dictionary, we don't need to actually do that. My bad. Um, we could we do this in two stages uh, for word and vocabulary uh, d sub word is going to get zero um, and then uh, that's just a primate and then I'm gonna say uh, oh I don't need to do that I don't need to prime it I can just say uh, it gets the split text dot count of the word it's the same logic I'm you know, I'm just overthinking. And so let's see how that rolls. Yeah, and that looks correct. So uh, building, there are three buildings in there and that makes sense, that's what we would expect. So, you know, there's a couple ideas here. Um, you know, we, we can make parallel lists and uh, you definitely wanna know how to make parallel lists, but we can also, uh, you know, replace in most cases, we can replace a parallel list with a dictionary. And um, that's going to be better in a number of ways. The only, uh, the only reason you might not do that is if you have to preserve order in some, you know, for some reason. And the order of occurrences of the words uh, need to be preserved. However, in this, in this scenario, we didn't preserve order because we cast the split text to a set. And set does not preserve order. So we already threw that out. Now, if we wanted to preserve order, we could um, we could make a collector function and build the vocabulary in order of occurrence. That would be fine. But um, we don't, you know, this is just a toy problem. So uh, I just wanted to demonstrate a way to go about this. So that's that's kind of a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot uh, using uh, parallel lists. But um, you know. 
you just want to keep in mind this idea of being able to relate two lists according to their in indices, right? That's how you are going to relate two lists. Now, in a dictionary, you don't have order, so you're not relating, um, you know, say word to frequency of that word uh, using an index. You have an explicit relationship built in the dictionary between a key and a value. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that makes sense and why those two concepts are related. Um, there's some information on tuples. We're, we're going to get into tuples later. Um, so I won't go over those in this moment. Let's see, I think I heard a question. Um, there's a question. Can I post that code? Um, oh gosh, I did make some adjustments here. Here, let me let me try to back this up to a working state, and I can share it. Um, Yeah, I'll go back to before that TF dictionary was created. And um, and then we'll have the parallel dictionaries and the uh, TF dictionary. OK, that should be it. So um, in this case, you've got for word frequency and zip, vocabulary term frequency, word dictionary, um, word gets frequency, or you could just build the word dictionary by calling out to um, gets build TF. Actually, we can just grab this exactly as it is. So either, either one of these, uh, either um, you could Oh, and we need a traversal of this. So for word frequency in, okay, I see what I see how this would work. So let me comment this out. Um, let's do for, yeah. Mm. I'll just do this as two separate things. So um, just so so that you can copy this code, play around with it if you want. Uh, let's do word dict to do that, and then we'll just say um, for uh, word frequency in word dict to dot items. Um, maybe I'll just print also here. Uh, print the f string of the word and the frequency and I'll just grab that as well and go down here and hopefully that's going to just print this thing twice look like it did okay that yep okay um, so one thing that's kind of cool is that these are uh, these should be the same dictionary word dict and word dict two uh, let's find out because uh, they <laughs> there's a chance that they're not uh, but let's just find out so let's do um, word dict is that equal to word dict to um, if it's not I'm not going to try to figure out why oh it is good um, it should be because the logic is the same um, there's just a chance that there would be something slightly different but but there wasn't so um, so I'm going to just copy all this and I'll put it in the chat. And play around with it if you want. It's, um, you know, just a thing. So, uh, but it does, it does also allude to another aspect of our analytic approach. You know, we're using dictionaries to analyze the frequencies of things. Um, we could uh, take a massive text and we could say, well, if you chose a random word from this text, what's the probability that it is the word building? Well, you can do that. Um, you can do that with these dictionaries, right? It's just uh, building, which is three, divided by the number of words, right? And um, we can think about it as 
uh, frequency in that sense. So these are count frequencies, but we could also think about them as percentage uh, or you know probabilistic frequencies. There's a question in here. Uh, sorry, I'm behind on the live stream a bit. What were those neural net functions you were talking about? Sigmoid, um, tan h, like T-A-N-H. So uh, let's just, we've only got a, a few minutes left. So, um, you know, let's just jump to sigmoid. Um, we don't cover sigmoid in the basic prep materials. Uh, we're considering it um, in part because it does come up so much. Um, but there, there are a few things we don't cover in the basic prep materials that um, would help a lot in the DSI for you to have understanding around. Like uh, sigmoid uh, logistic function, right? So this logistic curve, you know, when we're thinking about this, uh, often we're thinking about a classification problem um, where we have, uh, you know, positive results, negative results, true positives, false positive, uh, true negative, false negative. Um, but that's all stuff that you learn in the DSI uh, to great depth. And uh, it's not hard to grasp it, but it is kind of nice to understand sigmoid, uh, especially, you know, seeing this one over one plus e to the negative x. Uh, as the uh, sigmoid function. Um, this, uh, basically it gives you, uh, you have, you've got a threshold, and um, if you meet that threshold, you can cl be classified as positive or negative. And where you set that threshold, right, if you set the threshold at two, it kind of means that in this sigmoid, um, you have to have about a 0.8 probability, uh, a success, for, for uh, success, for to be classified as positive. Um, but, you know, that's just a light statement about sigmoid. Uh, related to that is tan h. And let's see if that takes us to just the Wikipedia. Yeah, the hyperbolic function tan h. Um, this is a very similar function um, used similarly in uh, neural nets from time to time. Uh, most often we use ReLU, though. Uh, ReLU is pretty awesome, the rectified linear unit. Um, so uh, ReLU looks sort of fun funny here, but it's just sort of like you get to a certain point and you, uh, you're you zero up until a threshold point and then you have a linear climb. Um, ReLU is actually a, a highly performance uh, uh, thresholding function in neural nets, but um, you know, uh, yeah. So sigmoid, uh, tan H, ReLU, those are really common. Um, yeah, I'll just put those those in the chat. Sigmoid, tan H, and ReLU. They're uh, very related, and we use them for thresholding. If you want to study up on them, they're they're a good time. They're uh, not necessary for the technical interview, obviously, but um, they are uh, going to you know understanding them is going to come in handy when you get into neural nets. Um, also, in the interview lectures. Uh, I'll just point this out really quick. Um, there is kind of this analysis of uh, sigmoid, just a simple analysis of sigmoid down here in part eight. So, you know, if you want to get, you know, just a little primer on sigmoid, it's covered here pretty, uh, you know, pretty element in a pretty elementary way. But um, yeah, that it's it's helpful to get a little bit of footing in it, especially using dictionaries to look at it. Okay, so next time um, we'll pick up, uh, you know, as always, we'll, you know, I'll answer questions and we'll take asides and things like that. We'll address people, you know, where they at, where they're at and uh, in, you know, in where their curiosity lies or in where they're stuck for sure. Um, and then we'll pick up with uh, break, continue, pass. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty close to finishing out the intro Python materials in study hall. Um, and, you know, we'll just continue through. So we'll we'll go through uh, the intro Python, then we'll go through intermediate Python, and then we'll get into stats. And uh, keep in mind that the strongest skills that we are really looking for you to, to build uh, in, for the time being, especially, uh, is your Python skills. Um, Python is where you're likely to get stuck. So get yourself unstuck before you get stuck. Um, and just, you know, Get, get as awesome as you can in Python, use it to solve whatever problems you can. And when you get into the stats materials, um, anything that's in here where you can write Python to get things done, write 
Python functions, whatever it is, um, do that, right? Do that. Uh, and, um, you know, anything that you're learning in, in the stats world in general, try to write Python for it. Uh, it gets a little tricky when you get to conditional probability and things that you'll probably just do by hand or with a simple calculation. But um, you can do this for a lot of things. So uh, that's just a recommendation. Um, we can get your stats up a lot quicker than we can get your Python up. So uh, practice Python a lot. And yeah, um, I will be, we'll have study hall on Monday, uh, same time. I'm sorry for being late today. Uh, just technical difficulties. I'm just, uh, I have this new machine and it's awesome and everything. And then I do an update and I find it takes half an hour when I thought it would take five minutes. So that's my bad. Uh, I will refrain from doing updates before streaming in the future. And um, I'll see you all on Monday. Uh, if you're in the premium prep, I'll, I'm teaching Monday night as well. So uh, see you all soon.